And before I start, I'd just like to pay tribute to Paul Fine, who's kept John Snow's name alive for such a, a long period of time here at the school. I was privileged to sit with Paul when he hatched this idea, when he was starting to hatch it. And it's been very interesting to see how, how he's pulled together a very, very important group of people. So, Paul, this is to you. My message, though, will be simple. It will be a simple message, and it's a message, really, that, uh, that isn't much different from the message that John Snow gave us over 150 years ago. It's simple, it's short, but it's not sweet. It passes through the tragedy, the personal loss, and also the shame and blame which, been, which has been associated with cholera from the Ganges to Soho and on to Haiti. And I just start with the graph that many of you have seen, most of you have seen, of the first weeks of the cholera outbreak in Haiti. This was a very important outbreak and a tragic outbreak occurring shortly after the major earthquake that occurred. And there were up to 500 people becoming ill each day with cholera at the very beginning. And you can see that the case fatality rate as well was quite high. It went up as high as 6% at some times. It was a very unexpected and very tragic outbreak. And it's, John Snow would have felt that this was no different than what he had seen. He knew that these outbreaks are tragic, that these outbreaks increase greatly. And as recorded by Reverend Henry Whitehead here, they also fortunately decrease. And they decrease, as we heard from Nigel this morning, because people flee the area where they're uh, occurring. And this is what happened in Haiti as well. People did flee. And you can see the beginning the outbreak and then people as they dispersed throughout the area where the outbreak began and, and further onwards and all the way through the country eventually. A very tragic outbreak, but again, this is no different than what John Snow knew. He knew how to map outbreaks. He knew what was occurring in outbreaks, and he knew what was necessary to stop them. John Snow also linked cholera, as did many, with military. And this is the UN peacekeeping force in Anupur, in Haiti. And you can see here a camp where the uh, Nepalese battalion was living. And you can also see the river that flows just outside. If you look at the internet, you'll see that there are many reports of dumping of septic tank con contents into that river from the camp. None of these can really be ver verified. There, there are photos that show trucks with UN dumping uh, waste into the river, but with the internet it's not possible to really verify that these are true photos. All the same, this was linked to the military, as was the international spread of cholera during the Crimean Wars back in 1854, when cholera was thought to have gone with the British military as they went further east. John Snow also would have been accepting of the difficulty in transport of many cholera patients, although this is certainly a very difficult situation in Haiti because the roads were destroyed, but still. The overwhelming number of people required um, very, very um, in innovative means of transport, and it's not much different than the transport by hand, which was occurring in London in the 19th century when people got sick with cholera. The same is true for mortality. Mortality was high in Haiti, tragic mortality, mortality that shouldn't have occurred, and coffins were transported to cemeteries. Snow, again, would have been very familiar with this tragedy of cholera here in London in the 19th century, a very, very difficult disease, one that shouldn't be occurring in the 21st century. These are the conditions that led to cholera transmission in Haiti. This is pictures that were taken after the earthquake, but they could have been pictures before the earthquake. Those of you who have been to Haiti know that the government did not invest in sanitation, did not invest in water, and neither did the international partners of Haiti. This is a situation which should not occur in the 21st century. John Snow would have been quite shocked to see the same situations as occurred in 19th century England occurring still in the 21st century in a world where there are means to overcome this. But there are some new tools that John Snow would be very interesting in seeing, 
And these new tools, if used properly, are very powerful tools, the molecular epidemiology. And this is the sequencing information from the uh, Haiti uh, cholera bacterium. And, of course, it was linked genetically to that data in Nepal. This was done in many, many different uh, scientific journals in many, many different laboratories around the world. And it was very important information. But did it serve any purpose to make these links? This is the ambassador of Sweden. It could have been the ambassador of many other countries because the announcement was made widely by the diplomatic service, by others, that there had been a link established between the cholera in Haiti, the UN forces, and Nepal. And as a result, there were demonstrations, as you know, in, in Haiti, adding to the cholera outbreak and adding to the tragedy already occurring. And these, are, these demonstrations were against the United Nations, against the group that was working with them to maintain peace and order, and caused massive demonstrations and death. There were up to five deaths recorded. Nothing is official, but there were deaths associated with these demonstrations. And today, there's a website that you can look at. There was compensation sought for the UN for over five, from over 5,000 cholera survivors to at least apologize publicly, if not to reinforce many different things that the UN probably couldn't do. But it's very interesting to see that there was shame and blame put many different places on Nepalese, on the UN, and on many others. And the situation continued in Haiti when there were over 150 NGOs working in Haiti to deal with cholera, each doing what they felt was most important. Now, cholera has been with us throughout the centuries, and as you know, it probably occurred much before uh, the 19th century, but uh, there have been seven different uh, waves of, of cholera um, throughout the era, and the most recently being the El Tor. Most of these, as you know, are thought to have uh, originated in the Ganges region, except for the El Tor, which is probably originated in Indonesia. This has spread rapidly. And many times, religious pilgrims, military, traders, and others have been implicated. And there's often been disproportionately high mortality among the lower socioeconomic classes, those who don't have the sanitation and the safe water. And quarantine has been the preferred means of stopping international spread in the past and until the recent past. And this was based on the original quarantine in Venice in the 14th century when they kept ships in harbor for 40 days to make sure that if plague was on board, it didn't enter into Venice. They also kept a quarantine at their land borders, keeping people in under observation, locked up for 40 days. Most countries then adopted quarantine to prevent cholera. Many times it resulted in discrimination at border posts. People were turned away, even though they might not be ill. Uh, it disrupted trade with economic repercussions, and, and especially in, in England back in the 19th century, which was a growing trade power and which was having its trade constantly interrupted and, um, and decrease in economic income. And actually, it usually failed to stop the international spread of cholera. But in Paris in 1851, there was the first international conference which was organized among European countries to standardize quarantine and other measures at border posts in order to stop infectious diseases at border posts. Europe and the U.S. joined in those discussions. The rest of Europe and U.S. joined in on those discussions through a series of international sanitary conferences and eventually this was transferred to all nations of the League of Nations and finally to the World Health Organization. In the World Health Organization, it manifested itself in the international health regulations, which were designed to ensure maximum security against the international spread of disease with minimum interference with world traffic and trade. These regulations were aimed at four infectious diseases, cholera, number one, plague, yellow fever, and smallpox. And the intent was to stop disease at borders. The regulations 
required notification of cholera, plague or yellow fever, and smallpox when smallpox was not yet eradicated. It had a minimum set of health measures that a country could require to protect itself at the border to get, make sure that vectors did not come in. And it equipped ports and airports with those vector proliferation, anti-proliferation measures. So the maximum measures that a country could require were many times vaccinations or some type of other non-quarantine, physical quarantine area. They worked by having a country report to the World Health Organization when they had an outbreak of one of these diseases. And that was published on the back of the weekly epidemiological record in very small print. If at the um, customs service or at the immigration or at the border posts, this were available in red, then if this said yellow fever in Senegal, the country would re could require a yellow vaccination certificate with a yellow fever vaccination certification from anybody coming from that country. Well, these regulations didn't work very well. They did keep yellow fever out of India and other places if yellow fever was destined to go there. But they, they didn't have the coverage that they needed to, to, they didn't have the disease coverage they needed to really be effective, and cholera continued to circulate around the world. So they were updated and redesigned in, 19, in 2005, and they were simplified to aim at two different things. And this is the new part. First, it was countries who have the obligation to strengthen the national core capacity for surveillance and control to global standards in order to rapidly detect and respond before diseases spread internationally, the heart of the international health regulations today. And countries are monitored on this, and, and bilateral donors are beginning to work with countries to make sure in developing countries that this is done. They also provide a global safety net mandatory reporting of possible public health emergencies of international importance so that the world can be on the alert should a country fail to detect and resp or respond to these diseases. Now, the decision tree that's used in the international health regulations was made with one of our colleagues in the audience by Johan Giseki, who, who developed this uh, over a period of years, a decision tree which helps any country decide whether or not what they're seeing is a public health emergency of international concern. Cholera will be one of those diseases, but there are many, many more. So really, we've gone um, from misunderstanding to understanding the importance of good public health. No longer do the international health regulations attempt to stop diseases at borders. What they do is they encourage good public health. So we've come from a point when we really didn't know what cholera was, was causing cholera, but we knew if we slept in clothed warm and um, um, did a few other things, we would certainly um, prevent the disease. But John Snow taught us what we needed to do, and today that's manifested in the international health regulations. Now, there are new tools to make our work easier, there is molecular epidemiology, and this is good when applied appropriately. It's good when you have polio cases in one country and you can see genetically that they've originated in another country. You can then deal with the epidemic in both countries. With cholera, that effort has not been made. Genetic sequencing is also important for influenza. H7 and 9 right now is a very important issue. The, genetic, the genetic sequencing is going on. The epidemiological studies are being linked. The same is for the novel coronavirus in the Middle East, epidemiology, molecular epidemiology together. So there are new tools that are very important, and John Snow would have understood these tools and their importance. At the same time, there are vaccines, but there have been vaccines for many years. In fact, the international health regulations at one time required also a cholera vaccination certificate on that yellow book, but with a vaccine which we know was not effective. Today, there are new vaccines, and those vaccines, however, are important. And they may have a role in containing an outbreak which is occurring, or even in preventing uh, cholera from occurring. But it's important to remember the conditions that do lead to cholera, because they still exist in many parts of the world. When cholera entered Peru in 1991, after 100 years' absence from Latin America, it spread through 
the favelas, through the slums of uh, Chile, uh, Peru, and throughout Latin America. And it's become endemic throughout, throughout the continent. Fortunately, it was not this, uh, not fortunately, this was not the strain that came in to Haiti, but cholera is everywhere, endemic, and will come. So nothing replaces good health. And I think that's the lesson that John Snow has taught us. And so what we're talking about is cholera from the Ganges to Soho or Haiti, or lessons in the importance of good public health. Nothing replaces public health. Shame, blame, border posts. Public health is good sanitation, safe water, and good basic epidemiology. Thank you.